The way that we're going to do this tonight is I'm going to introduce the panel in the order in which they're going to be speaking, but I'm going to introduce them all at one time. Then, starting with Kenny Mears, when he starts uh, his presentation, we're simply going to go through all uh, four of the panelists, or am I five of the panelists? I'm just, uh, my math skills are a little challenged tonight. And, uh, I thought I just got fired. Yeah, no, 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 you can't. No, no. I'm sorry, you can't leave um, once you're locked in. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear from each of the panelists in turn, and then we're going to open it up to some quick crosstalk across the panel, and I'll make uh, maybe a couple of uh, kind of linking remarks as well. Then we really want to hear from all of you here in the green room about any questions or comments that you might have on uh, tonight's uh, presentations and the panel topic. Tonight's topic is called Brave New Workplace, The Next Careers. We have five people who are really at the forefront of their own disciplines in relation to looking at what is currently happening in their own research, but also in their discipline. And we're asking them tonight to really uh, sit together and talk about what's happening in their discipline and how does it relate to the larger issue of uh, kind of a change in careers. Uh, let me introduce the panel. So starting over on my uh, far right is Kenneth Mears. And he's the Joseph Zitches Chair in Chemistry in the College of Natural Science and Director of the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research. Dr. Mears' research focuses at the interface between the computational sciences and biology, including computer-aided drug design. Kenny, as he's known, came to MSU from the University of Florida, where he was a, a University of Florida Research Foundation professor, the Edmund H. Prominsky Professor of Chemistry, and a member of the Quantum Theory Project. He has worked in industry as senior director for the Center for Informatics and Drug Discovery at Pharmacopeia, and Senior Director of the ADMIT Research and Development Group's Celsius uh, Software Division. He also is a, a founder of Quantum Bio, a software company in State College, Pennsylvania. He earned his doctorate from the University of Texas at Austin. On his left, Cheryl Sisk is a University Distinguished Professor in the Neuroscience Program in the College of Natural Science here in MSU. The common theme of research projects in, in Dr. Sis's lab is the influence of steroid hem, uh, hormones on nervous system structure and function. This is directed toward understanding the neural, endocrine, and behavioral changes that take place during puberty and adolescence. Cheryl teaches Introduction to Neuroscience too in the spring of every year. She earned her doctorate from Florida State University and was director of the neuroscience program for a spell, uh, which she no longer currently does. Uh, giving up uh, uh, administration for uh, research and teaching. On my immediate right, Carl Goode is the Media Sandbox Director in the College of Communication Arts and Sciences. He's a former Director of Information Graphics at Newsweek Magazine and the Associated Press. Goode has been a faculty member of the School of Journalism since 2006. He also teaches a large Media Sandbox class on creative thinking and problem solving. In 2013, Carl was recognized with the College Faculty Impact Award. On my immediate left is Ken, uh, Kenneth uh, Smuziak, who is the Managing Director of the Burgess Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Eli Broad College of Business. Ken teaches coursework focused on entrepreneurial mindset, small business creation and management, and business model development. Ken also serves as Director of the Hive. Prior to joining MSU, Ken served as co-director of the New Economy Division at the Lansing Economic Area Partnership, which many of you know as LEAP here in the uh, capital city. He earned his MBA from Northwood University. And last but not least, I'm very happy to have one of my colleagues on the, the panel tonight. Angela Hall is an assistant professor in the School of Human Resources and Labor Relations in the College of Social Science. Dr. Hall's research interests include employee accountability and employee legal claiming. She has taught a wide variety of courses, including business law, organizational behavior, human resources, leadership, and ed employee training and development. 
She earned her Juris Doctor and her Doctorate from Florida State University. So welcome to all of you. Thanks again to the Alumni Association for live streaming. And I'll turn it over to Kenny. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stand up. So good evening, everyone. Um, so I've been asked to really talk a little bit about next careers. And, and I'm going to use sort of the uh, pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical industry as kind of my model to talk about next careers in the STEM field in particular. So I, I call it the agony and the ecstasy, right? So the ecstasy is like uh, just an hour ago, I was looking at CNN, and they have a thing. Uh, a gal changes her career into STEM, and she doubles her salary, right? So the uh, ecstasy of this is STEM careers offer uh, typically uh, very good job prospects. But there's also uh, sort of uh, agony associated with it. Um, and there's, there's a number of different uh, agonies. There's sort of the employer perspective. Uh, their perspective is there's not enough people. Where are all the people that can uh, you know, populate these STEM-type careers? Um, and so they have to go uh, international or you know, bring people in, things like that. In institutions like Michigan State really try to face uh, you know, this dilemma and try to come up with ways in which to attract more people and retain more people uh, in the STEM fields. So in typical, what you find is that in the STEM fields, there's a high washout, and math is an issue. So for example, at Michigan State, there's a program now to catch kids early on that seem that want to do a STEM career but have some math deficiencies, and they can help catch them up. So this is one way in which you can improve that. Um, so math skills need to be burnished. And, and another thing, uh, you know, having a, a children, and they're going through middle school and high school math, we need to create better uh, teachers in the math fields in particular to help stimulate these STEM type careers. Uh, and so that's something that's on Michigan State to improve training uh, for high school and middle school and elementary school teachers in the mathematics fields. Um, parents and employers need to be more involved. I was driving over, NPR had a story about uh, a group, a uh, company in, is setting up uh, STEM training in Detroit to try to catch more people. So this is an example of participation of employers. Parents, so every night my daughter hates me, but I'm like, how'd you do in math today? What are you doing? Do you need any help? You know, how'd the quiz go? And so you need to be involved, I think, with your children at all levels to help them uh, think about, you know, developing their math skills. Um, you get a, a lot of complaints. You know, I'm involved with lots of companies, and they're like, well, wait a minute, you know, you're teaching everyone these sort of academic skills. You know, what about real world skills? Uh, and so uh, we need to think a little bit about commercial skills. And, you know, for example, Michigan State University just set up a new department, CMSE, which is really attempting to address kind of some of these issues in particular. Uh, many STEM careers require less than a BS degree. Um, who are good examples of people that have less than BS degrees and have done well in STEM? Well, I can think of Bill Gates. He's done okay, I think. Mark Zuckerberg. So in some cases, uh, you don't really need to have a bachelor's or a master's. Uh, in ICER, we have several employees that have high school or associate degrees in uh, sort of managing data or system administration, and they picked up these skills sort of in, you know, as they work on the job, as you will. So potential STEM career candidates, do I really have to take a lot of math? Typically, yes. Uh, another issue in the STEM field is men, only men need to apply. And this is a big problem. And uh, over my 30 years in the field, it's, it's improved, but there's still a long way to go to improve diversity in the STEM fields. And this is something I know Michigan State and many schools are facing uh, head on as best they can. Do you really need to get a BS, MS, or PhD to be successful? I get this question all the time. I went for a PhD because I wanted to be a professor, right? So that makes a lot of sense. You don't need a PhD if, if you're going to, say, be a system administrator. Um, you don't want to be a faculty member. So you have to think a little bit about how you want to approach this. Another thing I get from students all the time is I'm like, well, you know, what do you think your job futures are? And they're like, well, no problem. I'm in a hot field. You know, by the time I finish, I'll be good to go. Well, I mean, the problem is this year's hot field, everyone's reading it as the hot field. Four years from now, it may not be a hot field. Uh, when I started out my PhD, I was in a dead field, computational chemistry. Nobody thought you'd get a job. By the end, I had five or six job offers. So things changed very dramatically. And I went with my heart. I followed what I was interested in. Um, flexibility and become a lifelong learner. 
uh, this is really important. Uh, I've had a number of kids get PhDs in my group, and they're in careers like investment banking. Uh, they work for Amazon, work for Google, work for Facebook. They've completely changed from computational chemistry biology field into uh, different fields. They were trained as problem solvers, and companies like Google want them because they'll solve problems uh, for them. And, you know, in reading for this, the one thing that I just really loved in some of the readings they did was embrace the possibilities, right? What we do know, for example, that computers over the next 10 or 20 years are going to get much, much, much faster. So what can you do with that? If you all of a sudden you had three or four orders of magnitude, more powerful computers, what could you do? Um, three or four times the, the data storage capacity, what could you do? Um, you have robotic assistants, what can you do with these kinds of capabilities? Um, 3D printers, what could you do with those kinds of things? So it's embracing the fact that the technology world is changing, so instead of just thinking about where you are, think about where you want to be, uh, what these different things could bring to the table. And so what I'd like to do is really talk a little bit about how the pharmaceutical industry, biopharmaceutical industry or biotech industry is addressing these kinds of things. So, uh, Am I running way over? Okay, three minutes. Yeah, I think you should do it. Um, three minutes. Yep, no problem. Uh, so drug discovery is expensive. That's the biggest problem. The problem in drug discovery uh, is failures. If you start, say, 10 projects, uh, of those 10 projects, nine will fail. And you're going to spend money doing that. So you need to improve uh, success. Um, since we're short on time and we're really pressing, uh, what I can do is I'll just jump to uh, this slide and talk a little bit about uh, the drug discovery process and why it's so expensive. So it takes 10 to 12 years to discover a drug molecule. Uh, extremely expensive, I said, it's a billion to uh, $10 billion, depending on the numbers you look at. It takes a long time. And there's several different uh, sections. So there's basic research, uh, there's characterization of the drug molecules, toxicology testing, and then the clinical trials where it actually goes into uh, humans. And what the pharmaceutical industry uh, is doing, and in, in my research in particular, we're using um, large-scale computation, data analytics, uh, to accelerate the initial stages of this process. And the idea is if you can accelerate, instead of being a multi-billion dollar uh, project, if you can shave a few years off, you can save hundreds of millions of dollars and bring life-saving drugs to the market more rapidly. So I think with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Great, thank you, Kimmy. And we'll come back to, to uh, Kenny's situation with computational chemistry for those of you who have questions later. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, John, for the opportunity to participate in this uh, workshop. I'm really happy to be here. Um, John asked me to do a couple of things in um, my talk tonight. One is to uh, let you know some of the new and exciting uh, findings uh, in uh, the career path in neuroscience that I've taken, which is academic research. So I want to share with you uh, a couple of slides on that, and then to uh, broaden out and uh, talk a little bit about career opportunities um, outside of the, ones that, the one that I pursued in uh, neuroscience as a STEM field. So, um, as John said, I study uh, brain and behavioral development during puberty and adolescence, and basically what that means is that I study the teenage brain. Now, I myself actually study teenage rats and mice, but uh, the data that I want to show you tonight are uh, from uh, a, a growing body of research uh, done primarily in humans that have shed some very interesting and exciting insights into human adolescent brain development. Now this uh, picture on, from the cover of National Geographic is one of just uh, dozens that I could have put up here that have, uh, had feature stories on adolescent brain development, the teenage brain in the past 10, 15 years. And what's been so exciting about this area of research is that we've learned that there's a whole lot more going on in uh, the adolescent brain, the teenage brain, than we ever appreciated before. It really and truly is um, being remodeled, being reorganized, and is under construction. 
So what have we learned then about the construction? Well, let me uh, just walk you through a few aspects of this, um, this slide here. We're looking at uh, change in brain development of certain measures as a function of age, going all the way from uh, newborn out to age 22 or, or beyond. And I want to focus on uh, the, this middle portion in here, which is the regional peak and decline in synapses, neuromodulators, uh, blood flow, metabolism, and so forth. Basically, what this means is we're talking about changes in uh, synapses and connectivity within the brain. So circuits are being formed and uh, developed uh, over lifespan development. So the first interesting thing that we've learned is that the rate or the what happens during adolescent, postnatal and adolescent brain development is not linear. It just doesn't keep growing and growing and growing. No, there's uh, an inverted U shape here where, yes, during early um, uh, childhood and, um, uh, and development, the brain does go through a growth spurt. It is a spurt. It is forming synapses. It is forming new connections. But then at some point, you begin to see an actual decline or a pruning back of synapses. And what this reflects is um, the um, uh, creation of a, of a more finely tuned, uh, efficient brain. So the best analogy is with gardening, where if you want to have a bunch of great tomatoes in August and September, what you do back in April is sow a whole bunch of seeds. Uh, they all come up, but you actually pull back and prune uh, some of those seedlings because you don't, you, there's too many there for the available resources. And then once you have plants that flower, you will prune back flowers that, um, that don't look like they may be in a very good spot to get the best sunlight and, and so forth. So uh, pruning back and eliminating connectivity is, is a, a, a good way to um, refine and hone brain function. So that's exactly what's going on here. Okay, so two things that we've learned is number one, these three curves represent different parts of the human brain. So sensory motor cortex, this is um, the areas of the brain that are involved in uh, learning how to ride a bike and uh, beginning to develop your athletic skills and, and physical maturation. Then we have temporal cortex here and frontal cortex here. So, and I'll get back to that in just a second. But the point here is that different parts of the brain mature at different times during development. So when we think about adolescent brain development, we're really interested in this uh, period out in here, which is when um, individuals are learning how to become adults. They're learning to um, develop their independence, to make decisions on their own, to navigate the new social competencies and social spheres that, th that they have to be a part of in order to be successful as an adult. Now to parents and other adults, uh, the behavior of teenagers and adolescents can come across as risky, sensation-seeking, impulsive, uh, irrational. What were you thinking? Um, and, and so uh, it, it's, it's not clear at all how an adult uh, with, with uh, mature behaviors emerges on the other end of this. So that's uh, one thing. And then the, the other point I want to make that we've learned is that this process of brain development really is not complete in terms of thinking of all of the areas of the brain until the early 20s. So this period of adolescent brain development is much more protracted than we ever thought before. And in fact, if you are under the age of 25, your brain is still in this process of being constructed and, and built um, as you enter into full-fledged adulthood. So what has uh, neuroscience research on the adolescent brain uh, taught us about this period of development? Um, and what, well, one of the things I want to highlight is that it offers a, a, mes a mechanistic framework or explanation about why teenage behavior may be perceived or, in fact, is risky, sensation-seeking, irrational, emotional, um, impulsive. So to do that, let me just introduce a couple of uh, two brain systems that um, control our behavior. One is uh, primarily within the temporal lobe, which I just mentioned before. And um, these are subcortical structures. And uh, this is an emotional control system. So this is the system that, is, that drives your behavior based on emotion, based on 
your fears, based on your desires, based on um, uh, the, the immediate uh, rewards that might, might be perceived. Um, so that's one system, the emotional system here. The cognitive system is based in the frontal cortex, and this is the system that um, is rational, logical. Um, it it uh, uh, helps you think about the consequences of, of your behavior. And so we can think about these as two sort of opposing systems analogous to hot and cold, analogous to Captain Kirk um, and Dr. Spock in terms of um, systems that, that control our behavior. We can also think about this as immediate gratification versus delayed gratification. So these are our two systems. And what adolescent brain research has taught us, and it was alluded to in the previous slide, is that the uh, Captain Kirk system matures before the Dr. Spock system. And so what you end up having then during those um, adolescent years where uh, the limbic regions of the, the hot spots are, are basically um, out, outweighing uh, Dr. Spock. And so um, that, get, that doesn't mean that adolescents, people at this age, are not responsible for their actions, but it helps us, but viewing this from the perspective of brain development helps us to maybe understand why behavior is the way it is during that time. And just to point out that when you have a developing system like you do here, experience matters. So in other words, the choices that someone makes, the experiences that they put themselves in, those experiences themselves can shape and influence the trajectory of brain development during that time. Okay, so that's adolescent brain research in humans, transitioning now to opportunities here at MSU for careers in neuroscience. Just want to point out there's three different um, programs for uh, neuroscience training. We have a BS degree that's recently established. It's the most rapidly growing uh, undergraduate major here at MSU. We have a long-standing PhD program, and coming soon in uh, spring of 2007, there's going to be a graduate certification in uh, medical neuroscience. It's going to be an online program meant for people who want to hone their skills, maybe in between the bachelor's degree and, say, entering professional uh, school or something like that. And here are some short lists of career paths um, with a bachelor's degree in neuroscience and a master's degree in neuroscience. You can see that they are varied and numerous. <clears throat> and then finally, just to um, end, uh, in terms of advanced degree, um, I'm an academic researcher, professor. That's what everybody did when we went to graduate school. When I went to graduate school, that was your career path. Now, I'm considered the alternate career, the alternative career, because if you just crunch the numbers and the demographics, it turns out that uh, only a minority of PhD students or PhDs in neuroscience are going to end up doing jobs like I do. And so there are, though, many other avenues for um, a career with a PhD in neuroscience, including the ones that you see here. So with that, I will uh, end and turn it over to Carl. Okay, that was really great, Cheryl. Um, I just um, I'm going to stand too, but I don't have any slides. So imagine the awesome slides over here. This is pretty cool. Um, so I'm the anomaly in the group. I'm I I am uh, I only have a high school education, and I got I was one of those people who wanted to be an artist, moved to New York, uh, did incredibly well, which is a complete surprise to me, and wound up. Um, uh, working uh, a very successful career in journalism, Newsweek, and the Associated Press, and then getting a call to come teach this stuff at Michigan State University, and uh, and it, and now I'm, I'm I, so in a, way, in a weird way, I'm, I think I'm uniquely qualified to talk about what I'm going to talk about, which is um, is something Cheryl probably can elaborate a lot more on with the actual neuroscience going on here, which is is uh, is creativity and creative thinking, and why we become crippled thinkers and what happens to us and what we can do to get it back. And so what, I, what I've discovered after teaching creativity for six years, and I teach 500 students at a time, and, I, and I, I've really learned to see their projects and see the way they think. And what I've learned is that they're, 
they're, uh, they're not very good problem solvers. They're not effective, efficient problem solvers. They're actually pretty crippled thinkers. Um, they're cool and groovy and all of this stuff, but they're very, they conform a lot and they're, they're basically trying to satisfy everybody. And what, what, what I've learned is that when you're, when, you're, when you're a little kid, you're an explorer, right? You're, you're, you explore the world. You know, if you, they go out in the backyard and if you have a dog, you know what they're looking at and picking up and testing out, and <laughs> they're not they're not afraid of anything. Their their job as toddlers is to go explore their environment and figure out what's going on, what this is all about, and this fearless is what I'm talking about. They're fearless. It's all about them, but as they grow, they by the time they graduate from high school, they're they're they test very low for new idea generation. They think like everybody else. They're pretty much like everyone else. They're different, you know, maybe my sister's the, the creative one, she wears candy cane socks, she's got the streak in her hair. There are these individual differences we recognize, but it doesn't make you an effective thinker or problem solver. When I talk about creativity, I'm not talking about paintings, I'm talking about solving the problem of bullying or some other major complex problem, what they're called wicked problems, that, are, uh, that seem to have no solution. And those are where we re really need some good thinking. So what happens, well I think, you know, from a lot of the materials that I've read is what happens is as you grow up, so a kid, a, you know, a, a five-year-old or four-year-old, you know, draws a picture of their dog for the pure reward of drawing their dog. Well, I just drew my dog. And then the, in preschool, and then the kid next to you looks at that and says, you know, your dog sucks. Mine's better. And you, you experience judgment and it hurts and this starts to this starts to happen you start to get these messages throughout your entire youth that you are that who you are is actually not okay um, I certainly did um, you haven't lived till you've been spit on by the whole football team in the shower because you were overweight and so you start getting these messages from your peers that you're not like us you're different your schools give you messages that hey nice painting a nice portrait of the president Oh my God, as a matter of fact, amazing portrait of or the president. But you know what, set that aside because it's really just math and science that's gonna get you into college. You need to fit into that mold. So I didn't do well in math, I didn't do well in science, I couldn't get into any college I wanted to. And so I wound up um, moving to New York to try to be an artist, which I learned on my own. I've never taken an art class. So I just loved doing it, but it wasn't valued in my schools. It wasn't valued by my parents. And parents also contribute to this who you are is not okay, because you need to conform, you need to be safe, you need to get along with everybody, you need to be successful, you need to have the white picket fence, and this is what life is about in America. You cannot be a cage rattler or anything that's gonna get you arrested or sent to the dean's office or the principal's office, which I did a lot. Uh, so, so anyway, parent, but parents do this because they love you, they want you to be safe, they're not mean people, they really do want, they're thinking about you. Your friends are, you know, friend, the, your peers, we won't talk about peers. But uh, so, so schools do it, and schools require, requiring everybody to be a STEM person, a science, a math person, um, and not valuing some of these other skills, they, they love them, they teach them, they're, although they're cutting our programs like crazy. Um, the, the, it, it, uh, one thing I read was making every kid in school do really well in algebra and science Making every kid do well to get into college is the equivalent for some of us of standing on the 50-yard line and throwing a Hail Mary pass into the end zone and getting it caught or you don't go to college. It's kind of that crazy to some of us who are not from the STEM. So anyway, um, so what does this mean? We're, all of these messages we're getting that we're not okay causes us to fear risk. We're in risk averse. We become afraid and we, we basically are not able to share some of our ideas with our peers, like in a meeting, in a board meeting, or something like that, because we're afraid that we're gonna get laughed at or judged, or it's too, it's too scary to share these ideas in a meeting. So we censor ourselves. We basically are more worried about satisfying people in the room and conforming than actually making any change. And so we, when, and what this is is a mental death sentence for you. And so we, we basically become these ineffective thinkers and problem solvers. So that's the bad news. The good news is there are ways to start, to, to turn this train around. And all of that, all of that, I have notes on what those things are, on what a lot of these things are, but it's really basically recognizing that you can be a better thinker, 
recognizing when you are shutting down and censoring yourselves when you do have an idea and recognizing that if it's your first, second, or third idea, it's probably the same idea everybody in the room has. It's not gonna be very special. You wanna dig deep. There are all kinds of things. There's design thinking, uh, complex problem solving models. There are all these models you can look for that will help you in the corporate cultures. Corporate culture for problem solving is terrible. It's getting into the boardroom and the boss sits there and go, anybody have any ideas? What are we gonna do here? Death to thinking in a room like that. There are creative ways in a corporation, in a company, to, be, to, to just generate ideas and celebrate your employees' brains and make them feel comfortable doing it, being playful and stuff. But you as an individual, um, you can, there are several things you can do just as yourselves. First of all, accept that you were born creative. It's not your sister. You were born with an amazing ability to generate new ideas. That's what you do. You're just, and you're exploring and you're making connections between dog poop and smearing on walls. It's what kids do. It's what you're, you were wired to do. You are creative, you've just lost it and you need to reconnect with that. Um, people are gonna try to push you in a different direction in a way that's not comfortable for you and you have to learn about that and to say, no, I'm not gonna go that way. Um, look for opportunities to fail. Don't just do the stuff you're good at. So kids, it might go, be time to go golfing with your parents, and parents, it might be time to pick up that game player and start playing video games with your kids. Really learning about that kind of stuff. Don't strive to be perfect. You're, when you're, when, and, and judge, judge ideas when you're brainstorming. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of ideas get thrown out and connections are made, but you're not, you're, look, you're not looking for the right idea. You're just looking for ideas. And trying to be perfect is, is a really hard thing to keep up. It's much, I, one thing I recognize my, about my students is that there are, they're, they're all different personalities, all different interests, all different abilities, and they all have different paths that they've taken to get there. And they're all wonderfully and perfectly unique out in front of me. They're not perfect kids, and they're a mess actually in many ways, but they sit there and they stand it. And we have to recognize that this is a good thing, this is a great thing, because I'm as imperfect as they are. Um, and uh, was there one more I wanted to say? Yeah, no, I think that's about it. Be curious. Don't lose that curiosity. So that's all mine. Okay, so we're switching to this side of the table. And I have to follow Carl. Thanks, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told me that you oh, were friends, so Ken. We are. So we are good Ken. friends. Ken's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I've I've uh, I've titled my my short little slide deck "Startup Humans." So as John mentioned, my, my role here at Michigan State, uh, once again, Ken Smuziak, I'm the managing director for the Burgess Institute for Entrepreneurship at the Broad College of Business. It's a really long title. Um, and I've been at Michigan State for three years, I think, uh, well, just a little bit shorter than, than Carl has been here. And we've, we've gotten to know each other really well through the time, so it's great to have him on the panel with us. But my job, in effect, is to, uh, as many people think, is to, to help students start their own careers, right? So um, I teach entrepreneurship, I teach business model creation, I teach students to think entrepreneurially uh, while they're here on campus. And like Carl, I teach a 500-person lecture full of students eager to learn more about what that means. Um, and so in the context of our conversation today, um, I was thinking of ways in which I relate my teaching back to the new career front. Um, and uh, so I've, I've, I've made this short agenda. Clearly, we're going to cover two topics. Uh, one is the business context of this, and one is the human context of my topic on startup humans. So um, first things first is, uh, this concept of thinking like an owner. And um, a lot of, uh, uh, if you don't know, we actually just launched a minor here at Michigan State University um, in entrepreneurship and innovation uh, that just went live this spring. And um, it seems a little bit like a, um, an oxymoron to have a, a minor in entrepreneurship and then go try to get a job, right? Uh, so you walk in with your resume and the, 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 the business owner looks at it and says, so you have a minor entrepreneurship, how long are you gonna stick around? Is your goal to start a new company? Is your goal to not work here for long, just gain experience and maybe steal my clients, whatever it might be. Um, and, and we're hitting that head on with, with this concept of thinking like an owner. So uh, we're trying to create uh, students uh, within the minor and here at Michigan State University that have an appreciation for 
what it's like to be the owner of a company from the standpoint, if you don't own your own, then maybe it's as an employee and to have an entrepreneurial mindset. So from a problem solving standpoint, how do you approach complex problems in the workplace? You could work for a 500 person firm or a 5,000 person firm, or maybe you're working for a five person startup. We want uh, students at Michigan State University who are participating in this field to really embrace the fact that when decisions are made, they have an impact. And they don't just have an impact on you, they have an impact on your clients, your customers, your shareholders, whoever it might be. And the entrepreneurial mindset is really what can drive that. Um, and so this thinking like an owner has, has I think, has deep, deep meaning in terms of what it means for the next career front. Um, and so um, from a business context standpoint, I've, I've broken it up into two spaces. Uh, one is the market, and then kind of what is the response uh, that business owners and or entrepreneurs take to, to the marketplace. Um, so first, you know, we're dealing in this period of time now, and I call the market broadly the economy, the global economy, whatever you want to call it, the global marketplace, where high volatility is a, and uncertain times tend to be um, a going concern for us now. Increasing technological pressures, obviously that changes the game in terms of what types of jobs are available in the marketplace, how quickly things change. Um, environmental pressures, I think we, we've all come to the conclusion that um, there's some big things on the horizon that we're going to need to face down as a civilization in order to have success, uh, long-term success, um, high expectations, globalization. And I think there's this, uh, I don't know if this is a term used or not yet, but I came up with the term uh, temporal anxiety. And I just, I get the impression from my students and I get the impression from, from business owners who I work with, is just, just kind of this anxiety that everything seems so short term. Like, like long term thinking is really difficult because of all of the pressures that we're, we're now seeing within, uh, you know, and as I call it, the marketplace or society, whatever it might be. Uh, but in response to that, entrepreneurs tend to jump into two, two things, right? It's we we kind of respond in a way that's about innovation, it's about speed, it's about flexibility. How do we, how do we um, you know, really diversify our product offerings? How do we experiment? How do we rapid prototype? We meet these, these, these market demands, these market issues with new ways of business problem solving, right? And this is just a short list. Uh, we, we're really big on customer discovery and feedback here at Michigan State University as one of our teaching methodologies. Um, and in particular, this, this translates into a, a methodology known as Lean Startup. Um, for those of us who are students in my room, I, I preach on this a lot. Um, and this was uh, developed by Eric Reese uh, and Steve Blank, are really the big proponents of this concept. Uh, but this idea that, that as a startup, as a startup business, um, no longer do we spend time on R&D and you know, a bunch of uh, resources deployed in ways that we don't know how the market will respond. Technology has allowed us to really get product to market very quickly and also create customer feedback loops very quickly so we can change, iterate create a new prototype, not waste resources, those types of things. And it falls into this experiment, learn, repeat model, right? So, uh, you know, build a prototype, get it to market, get customer feedback. Customer feedback says, we need blue lights, not red lights. Get it back in the lab, fix it up, get it back out to market, try again, we need new features. And using as little resources as possible to potentially solve the customer's problem and, and actually uh, keep doing that until you pass the iteration cycle and then you can move into to growth, uh, to the growth phase of a business. So um, the next component that we teach often here at Michigan State is this concept of, of a business model. Um, business model canvas is our, in particular, is our um, subject matter expertise. Uh, and so uh, this was developed by Alex Osterwalder. This is a visual framework for the nine components that go into making a business. There's been lots of iterations on this. Uh, I, I like the classic, I like to mess around with it a little bit, but the reality is, is that if you, you can break any business down into these nine categories. Um, and so I start with my students thinking about the value proposition. This is the, the something you're offering the marketplace. If you look at the left side of the equation, these are the activities necessary to make your something, okay? Um, and I'm moving quickly through this because I'm gonna, I, I, wanna, I wanna really wanna hit on the next slide, but I, I, wanna, I just wanna get you guys up to speed on this. The right side of the equation is how you sell the something you're offering the marketplace. Your customer relationships, who you're selling to, how you're gonna get it to them via channels, and then money in and money out, okay? And so uh, in preparation for this, this presentation, uh, John asked us to think about how we relate what we teach back to this next career's you know, future marketplace for, for job growth. And um, so I came up with this amazing concept, okay? Um, and I like using memes. 
Um, I just taught Carl's class only using memes, which was a complete disaster, but it was fun. Um, <laughs> they said they liked it. <laughs> they liked it. They don't smile. So, don't. no. Um, and so here's the human context, right? And so I, I'm looking at the list of business contexts, and I'm thinking the same thing. Like, in reality, these are the things that all of us as individuals still feel the pressures from, right? These, these same pressures that exist in the business marketplace are the same things that affect us now, right? It's the same things that make, give us anxiety, the same things that make us think about careers. And in many ways, the responses we have have to be similar, um, in, in my opinion. And so then I, I was going through more framework. So I, I mentioned the first, in the first one I said, a startup is a temporary organization in search of a repeatable and scalable business model. Well, I guess we can just change out some things. And really, in many ways, humans, us as people seeking careers or seeking validity in the marketplace for our skill set, is the same way, right? We enter this, this, this model, and this model holds true now. Um, you know, I, the, the days of, you know, the 20-year corporate career is kind of come and gone. And so thinking about the fact that really this lean startup methodology now applies to us as, as employees or potential employees, I think is a really interesting thing. So then of course I had to keep going with my construct here um, and thinking about this, this employee model. And so your something is this, right? So as a potential employer, I started thinking really it, the value proposition rings true, the same as it does for any business uh, as an individual. What do you have to offer the marketplace that solves a problem, right? And I think this is often where students get stuck, or maybe everyone gets stuck, in formal training is the end of my skill set. And that can no longer be an acceptable answer. Um, and I, you know, Kenny hit on this earlier in terms of we have to think long term. We have to think about how we're training ourselves to be better corporate citizens, how we're training ourselves to be more skilled in the workplace. So lifelong learning has to be included here, and we can no longer accept you know, your value prop is only your formal training. And then if we substitute our customer segment with our employer, we have to really start thinking about where our, where our needs, I have to stop. So anyway, now, stop now. Okay, well, let me just fill this in real quick, and you guys can look at this thing. And I'll go through this quickly. So anyway, we got our value prop. I've just kind of subbed out all the things that I thought were pretty much applicable to the business model canvas and applied them to what I would think of as, as, as a human trying to interact in the job market. And I, don't, I think it's a really interesting construct now that I did it, and um, not to pat myself on the back, that was my intent. Um, but in many ways, we have to start thinking ourselves as human startups. We have to start thinking about ourselves and how we fit into the construct of a new, uh, new frontier in business creation. So anyway, that's it. Uh, and um, there's my last slide take action, uh, develop strategies. So anyway, thanks so much. It was a blast. <laughs> Eight minutes of fast. Hello everyone, I'm Angela Hall and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Human Resources and Labor Relations. Um, in our school, we do teaching and research on areas that affect employment and the workplace from the perspective of both the employer and the, org the, the organization and also the employee. So we look at two perspectives in our work. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about careers in the brave new workplace. And what I think is very interesting is that um, I didn't prepare my presentation in conjunction with the rest of the people on the panel, but I'm going to cover some of the same things. So at least I feel kind of validated in that one regard. Okay. Um, Ken just talked about the notion that people don't think they're going to stay with the same employer for um, 20, 30 years. My mom did. Most people of that generation or a generation before, that was something that wasn't unexpected. That, that was, uh, but now, we don't expect that. We have the notion of a protean career. A protean career really means that you're the captain of your own ship. Rather than that notion of a paternalistic organization that was going to take care of you and guide you through your career, 
you have to take control of the of the reins, grab hold of the reins. And from that, that means that you need to put yourself in situations where you can get the development, the skills, the knowledge that you need. And oftentimes that requires moving around from jobs. In, and also an added benefit bit is that when people move jobs, oftentimes they get that increase in salary too. Um, but the notion of the coordinating career is something that is here to stay, um, it looks like. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that baby boomers, on average, held about 12 jobs from the times they were 18 to 48. It was a massive study over uh, uh, people in the baby boom generation. And another uh, more recent study by LinkedIn found that by the age of 32, most people had four full-time permanent jobs. So how do most people choose a career? Well, advice from others. I'm always giving my daughter free advice, right? I'm giving my students. You go to your teachers, your professors. Or how about your major that you may have? Like if you're a criminology or criminal justice major, it might just seem like, whoa, well, what do we all do? We go to law enforcement. Or that might be just a default from your major. It also could be, the literature calls it serendipity. You might just get a, a career because you just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Said Someone said, hey, we're looking for someone over at so-and-so's place, and you get hired there and you work there a couple of years and develop a skill set and then you take that to your next job and then you develop a vocation out of that. But the experts say um, about how you should choose your career is to think of the term vice. Values, what are your values? What do you value most? What are things that are important to you? Um, interests, what are you interested in? And the reason why you want to be interested, because it's one thing to come to work and you know just have to plod through, but it's another thing to be en energized and engaged. Like when I get into the classroom, I feel energized by my students. Um, but you also have to take consideration skills. Like you could be a person who loves video games. My husband and my daughter love video games, right? But and you might say, I want to be a, ga a video game designer. But if you're not good at writing code, well then, you know, that's probably not going to be a real good career for you. Another thing that people don't look at is the notion of environment. Um, the the um, environment that we work in has to do a lot. I think about the notion of the example of a surgeon. It's one thing being a surgeon in the pristine research university hospital. It's another thing being a surgeon in the middle of a battlefield and bombs are going off. It's the same occupation, but the environment may differ. So that's the other thing that people should think about. You know, what kind of environment do they want their uh, career to uh, flourish in? What do you need for career success? Intelligence. In general, the notion is that smart people do well at work. Well, there are some studies that, or some ideas at least, that some people might be too smart for certain positions. Uh, but the notion is, is that at least you have to have the, um, a certain level of general mental ability, also called intelligence or IQ, to be able to perform the cognitive functions of a job. The next Thing, next point, though, is emotional intelligence. Research has found that emotional intelligence is exponentially more important than your general mental ability. And emotional intelligence is your ability to look at social cues and be able to adapt and respond appropriately in the situation. Personality. I bet a lot of you out there have had to take a personality test for, uh, to be hired for a job or through the selection process. And that is something that's very uh, popular. 80% of the Fortune 500 does personality testing. And I do some research in this area. Well, most of the personality tests that are out there, um, um, except for the Myers-Briggs, which has some aspects of personality, but most of the other ones really look at the uh, big five uh, aspects of personality. And one of those are um, conscientiousness. And there is research that shows that, um, that there is a modest but positive relationship between being conscientious and doing a good job. And conscientiousness is just a personality trait, which suggests that individuals who, um, well, a conscientious person is a person who works hard, who does their best, who's deliberate when they do things. And um, 
that's, you know, people do well in their conscientious, whether they're a ditch digger or whether they're a neurosurgeon. Conscientious people usually have higher performance. Grit. There's been a lot of notion of and um, talk about grit in the media recently, especially trying to teach elementary school kids grit. And, you know, there hasn't been a lot of long-term uh, studies on it, so I don't know the efficacy of that effort. But grit is, ne is a little bit like uh, conscientiousness. There's some overlap, but it's a distinct concept. It is the notion of perseverance, just chugging, chugging through, no matter the odds. Even though chugging through is not necessarily the right thing, because sometimes it's good to say, hey, I've made a bad decision, and, and, and turn away. So people who are high in grit sometimes have an escalation of commitment and keep on going on and on, even when people should say, quit, quit now. Creativity. Carl talked about that. The n we live more in a service economy now, and things aren't black and white, and the ability to problem solve and to make novel solutions is an amazing um, skill to have and one which will take you far in the workplace. Political skill. I do research in political skill, and I'm really excited about this because political skill is the ability to uh, in influence people, to engage in impression management in a way that you can get things that you want. And the research has shown that people who are high in political skill have better jobs, get higher raises, they're more liked by their boss. The thing that's interesting about political skill is that someone is influencing you who's high in political skill and you might not even know it because they're just that smooth. And we know the great thing about political skill is that unlike conscientiousness or even grit, which may be a personality determinant uh, or dimension and which are pretty fixed from your childhood, they can maybe be nudged up a little. Political skill and creativity are things that can be taught um, as uh, when someone is an adult. Career outlook. Uh, Fast Company uh, published a list of the skills that you need for jobs of the future. And it's very interesting because people on our panel touched upon several of these. Um, of course, technology and computational thinking. And you might say, well, hey, I'm not going to a STEM field. Even a English professor would need some type of technology skills because we're doing distance learning, we upload our grades online, things like that. Caregiving is another area which is going to have a lot of need in the future because um, we have an aging population and we're going to need more people who are doctors, physical therapists, home health care people. Social intelligence and the new media liter literacy. Remember I talked about how emotional intelligence is important? Well, it's important to be able to, be a to um, negotiate social situations, but also to be able to use the different new media that are coming along all the time. I mean, um, 10 years ago, who was thinking about like Snapchat and Instagram and all those types of things? Lifelong learning, like my colleague Ken talked about, people change careers. This is my second career. I practiced law for seven years before I went back at the age of 30 to get a PhD. So constantly being able to change and get the skills that you need. Adaptability and business acumen. Um, adaptability it has the notion of um, and the, uh, uh, Fast Company and the Bur Bureau of Labor Statistics um, were both published um, um, information stating how we live in a gig economy. You know, there's so many contractors, there are people who have part-time work, there are people who change careers, and to be able to look at the environment, to be able to scan it and say, hey, I need to develop myself in this way so that I can be successful is very important. So my final slide, what makes people happy? Well, is it money? No, it isn't, not really. Um, there's a study that's very much cited that by um, two, no, I'm sorry, two economists, and it said that um, pay satisfaction kind of uh, starts to peak off, level off at 75,000. That was done like in 2010. There was one done a few years later that says that pay satisfaction actually tapers off at 50,000. So what this is telling us that you need enough money to pay your bills, but after some point, you know, the, you know, money is just money and you don't necessarily uh, feel motivated by it. You're upset when it's not there, but it doesn't necessarily really engage you. You more so need fit with your job and with your career. Flexibility, people love, especially our millennials, they like to telecommute, they like to choose their job assignments. I have a student, um, well, a, a graduate from our program, and she went and she got be able, she was able to give herself her own job title and it was HR ambassador. Like, how cool is that? You know, people like the type of flexibility, telecommuting, um, and also recognition. 
people want to be able to have their contributions recognized, valued, and they are more likely to take ownership and then be engaged when they can. Well, that's all I have for now. Thank you so much. Well, what a rich conversation so far. Let me just mention a couple things. I'd like to open it up to the panel to make any commentary or ask each other questions and then open it up to all of you after that. I think what we've heard is really fascinating because the fact that all of us probably rise and fall from the ability to make mental models within the world in which we find ourselves. So even the way that people put together their PowerPoints, the idea of needing to be creative and really taking on uh, uh, problem solving uh, about our world. We've seen a number of different mental models tonight in terms of how to organize our thinking about the world in which we find ourselves and the world in which we want to have an effect. So we've heard a lot about impact, we've heard a lot about personal growth, and some of that is both biologic on the one side or intentional kind of career planning. And I love uh, Ken's whole notion of human startup that really it's about making choices. I think you've heard a variety of things tonight about what happened when each of these individuals came to a point where they made a choice to be different than what they were. They saw a different kind of opportunity and they moved into it and they're even saying to probably everyone here that you too can make choices and that there continue to be uh, great possibilities. The world is replete with possibility from, from what we heard. So it's really about creating building blocks and looking at the speed of change, the rapidity of change in terms of the things that we've heard. Now, I've got a couple of specific questions, but I'll hold those for later. Instead, what I'd like to do is invite the panel to really comment on anything that they heard from uh, each other, this kind of conversation that uh, has really built quite nicely across the panel. Any questions for each other or, or comments before we open it up to the audience? Questions? Comments? Okay. I can speak with any one of these people for an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and we can. And that's one reason we do this is so that all of you can recognize these folks as people that you might want to reach out to in the future. So why don't we, at this point, uh, I'll call on my colleague Stephanie, uh, who has the microphone. So just raise your hand if you have a comment or a question uh, for the panel. The floor is open over here. I have a question for Angela, but it's obviously open to the entire panel. Um, you were talking about protein, sorry if I butchered that, careers, and I was wondering if you think that that is on the side of the new generation who is going out to find these careers or the employers that are hiring them. Are they going in with that mindset that they're not going to be there very long or is that more of the employees feeling like they have that flexibility to go from career to career? I think that the notion of a protein career was driven by um, a few things. Changes in technology and the fact that in the, tech, in the technology sector that people moved around from job to job and startups and such and there was a constant influx of new ideas. But I also think that even predated that was the notion when people went from the pension, organizations went from the pension to the 401k. People stayed with their jobs because they felt stuck and they couldn't leave. And now, and with a pension too, your organization is like more invested in you and you're invested in the organization. With the portability of 401ks or if you're in the public sector 403bs, it makes it so that there's not that ball and chain or anchor that's moving, that's keeping you down. So, so I guess um, it's two things, the employer side with the retirement and also the uh, employee side when they realize that they were free that they can go around and get more opportunities opportunities and development as well and didn't feel stuck because in that old paternalistic model where you stayed at one employer for uh, one uh, for your entire career you probably didn't have as much choice and you know as much options as a lot of people I'm sure hit ceilings where they couldn't um, rise any further other comments from anyone about about that issue let me just jump in just to say that uh, since I happen to be one of uh, Angela's colleagues 
that I've actually characterized it to some people is that we're into a new um, kind of low loyalty expectation that I think that many people believe that their uh, boss has very low loyalty to them and therefore that they really need to give uh, very uh, little or low loyalty back to uh, the employer. And as uh, already has been mentioned, the whole notion of a gig economy where I am the sum of my contracts, I am the sum of, <clears throat> of my, my skills and, and my uh, uses of them within the marketplace, that changes dramatically the whole notion of who's the employer and what kind of responsibility does one have to them besides the specific you know, uh, small snatch of time that they've purchased you for the, the specific thing that you're doing for them. And another question uh, or comment from the room over here. While uh, she's in transit, let me just uh, uh, direct a quick question to Cheryl. <coughs> How does culture matter when it comes to brain development? I mean, I have to admit that uh, this whole notion of maturation at a certain time, would we see this in China and Africa in the same way? Would we see it in urban and rural? And would we have chemical kind of uh, impacts on this? That is, does the environment that we're in shape it based on what kind of chemicals we're ingesting uh, each day in our life? Great question about whether this protracted period of brain development is biological versus cultural. And I suspect that culture has a lot to do with it because it's hard to imagine that humans evolved to just be not adults until they're 25 years old and when they were only going to live 30 to begin with. Um, but we don't have the data to, but it, the, the way you might look at that is uh, developed versus developing co uh, countries or cross-cultural because that sort of segues into your second point um, or s second aspect is that um, when, when demands are placed on an individual to be adults, sit up and sit straight and start taking care of your kids and start uh, bringing in um, money to pay the bills, if that happens at 18 or 19 or 20, your brain's going to respond to that experience. And um, I, I don't mean to be um, cynical at all, but I mean, we, we have kind of, we're lowering our expectations about when we expect um, people to step up to the plate and be independent and start fending for yourself and um, so forth. I mean, be on your parents' health care until 26 years of age. So that's one thing. Uh, your second point about environmental chemicals. There's a secular trend in um, earlier onset of puberty. So it's a, it's a funny thing because if you think about this in a big picture, I've talked about the tail end of adolescence is getting pushed later and later and later to now mid-20s. But at the same time, the onset of puberty, which is when reproductive maturation starts, and that's your first sign that you're about to become an adult, um, that that's happening earlier and earlier. So we're, we're just making this whole period of development um, bigger and bigger. Um, but there's some uh, suggestion in the literature that earlier onset of puberty may be the result of exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds um, that mimic hormones in um, bodily tissues. So the only caveat I would say there is that may not be a true advancement of the onset of puberty, what it may just be doing is um, creating secondary sex characteristics that look like you're going through puberty when your brain's not actually started that yet. But then the other side of that is, well, who cares? If you look like you're going through puberty and you look like you're about to become an adult, then guess what? You automatically get started, you know, you're, you're, you're treated differently by your friends, your parents, your peers, your teachers. And so it's, it's all a very interesting, complex interaction between environment, cultural expectations, what you look like, the experiences you have, uh, what the expectations are. And altogether, I think it's creating this, you know, you spend 20 years of your life in this state of development that we call, you know, puberty and adolescence. So, 
Sorry, that was a long, no, it's long a, winded. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> it's great stuff. Okay, over here, we have a question. So my question is for anyone or all of you on the panel. And so basically, I was just wondering what any of you hopes or thinks will be the next big technology or idea or problem solved in your respective fields. Oh, I have a, yeah. oh. Joe, are you gonna go? Go. Um, Well, one of the, one of the things that, uh, the, the, the reason for being a more effective thinker is uh, I think that, uh, I'm not a computer scientist, but it, it all, you know, uh, all, all indications are that computers are going to be able to think as well, if not better than us, uh, be able to make connections and, and brainstorm and think better than us uh, in, 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 not, not too, in the not too distant future. So if computers can solve problems or if computers can make decisions and learn and start making stuff like cars, with it, it completely humanless factories, completely driverless cars, all of these things, what's going to be the use of humans? What is your what? Do you, what value do you bring to this <coughs> world? And uh, to me, what I, I still think that it's a long way off for computers to actually be able to think, to generate completely new ideas, to be to bring that creative element to the to the world. That because uh, throughout history, one of the things that we've done as a species is we're we've never been satisfied with where, with where we were. We were always like. Huh, I wonder what's over that hill. So we're risk takers by nature. It's like, I'm gonna go find out, dead. Um, I'm gonna melt this rock and see if I can make a spear out of it. You're dead. Um, and then, you know, we develop all of these, we've gone, we're just developing and learning and growing and pushing and risk taking all the time. Computers aren't gonna be able to do that. And I think it takes a special kind of a brain that's going to, uh, that is going to keep our species moving, advancing forward in, in every area. In, in thinking and making in all those areas. And I don't think computers are going to quite be that way. If they ever get that way, then those wars between computers and humans you see in the movies may come true. But that's what I think the future of technology is. So you have to ask yourself, what value am I bringing as a human species to this world that a computer is not going to be able to do for me and better than I'm doing? And that's what we have to worry about and think about. From Karen? Yeah. So I mean, basically, the, the comment I made about embracing the potential, right? We do know computers in the next 10 or 20 years, so when you start your career, are going to be three, four orders of magnitude faster. You're going to be able to store much, much, much more information. You're going to have access to much, much more information. Uh, you're going to have self-driving cars, all these kinds of things. So how do you use these things? So like in my field, I know that I can develop algorithms and technologies that will accelerate the drug discovery process. So it'll be faster, cheaper, and better high quality compounds and drugs will be made available and save lives. And so I think that is the big breakthrough that you're gonna see that computation is gonna play an ever greater role in uh, developing you know, pharmaceutical compounds. So to kind of answer your mm -hmm. specific question about my field. And I have a small little biotech startup that's exactly is doing that. We're developing cutting edge technologies that pharmaceutical companies want to use to accelerate this process. Um, you know, and so it, uh, you know, this is what's happening, I think, in the computer world. And, you know, for example, Michigan State has a top 200 fastest computer in the world on campus. So we have people on campus, you know, doing cutting edge calculations in a wide range of fields from humanities to physics, uh, taking advantage of this development. You know, and in three or four years, we're going to install a top 100 machine, right? So we keep uh, pushing the boundaries. And we're going to, uh, along with the computation, you'll also have the data storage capacity, um, ability to transfer data amongst various groups around the world and in the country. So um, I'm just going to, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of just continue on with that theme because I think, you know, what Carl mentioned earlier about conformity. I think the really interesting thing that's happening with technology in general, not that I want to stick with this theme per se, but it, it's it's allowing us to break through, you know, the, the boundaries that currently exist. And this has been true for all of mankind, but now it's just happening at a much more exponential rate. And so I think when you think about um, how it'll change the skill sets needed moving forward, um, I like to think of it as... Um, we're going to have a really, really um, interesting time ahead of us where we can offload labor 
that was once done by humans to more and more complex pieces of equipment. And this is traditional, this is what this, the human race is built on, this is why we're here today, is the ability to do that, right? And have this conversation we're having in this room. But if, they, if, if, if machine learning and those types of things prove true, then our ability to reach way, way beyond our imagination is not far around the horizon. And so I think as, you know, if I put myself in the position of my students is, the stories that we're seeing now from the people we consider to be innovators or forward thinkers, Elon Musk unveiled his plan to go to Mars today, if no one caught that. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Peter, Di Peter Diamandis who's looking to mine asteroids as they fly by Earth. I mean, the stuff that, that was science fiction is, is now within the realm of possibility, and I think it's hard, I think it's even more hard maybe for people in the United States or from other westernized countries to get outside the realm of consumerism and really start to think about businesses that are high impact, game changing type things. And so to embracing that technological change and, and not looking at it as some sort of dystopian future where robots will be doing everything for us and you know, I'll be fat and riding on our scooters like in Wally, -E, right? Uh, is is what the opposite of that is that we can use our creativity as Carl talked about to do crazy amazing things that I mean, interplanetary species is something we've never even known before. And we're talking about 2025, a manned mission to Mars. It's insanity. I mean, it's craziness. It's crazy talk. But to me, it's super exciting. So um, I don't know. From an entrepreneurial perspective, I think we're just going to have a lot of technological change that frees up new marketplaces that will need to be explored by creative, um, crazy thinkers. And hope Carl's the president on Mars. <laughs> you won't get me in that can, in that tin can. <laughs> I'm going in a tin can. Sure. Well, just as far as uh, this, as far as uh, this question applies to neuroscience, I mean. These folks have been talking about imagination, creativity, um, uh, uh, forward thinking, and and with neuroscience, I think the the most cha challenging, and then this, you know, how are, are complete computers going to replace us? Um, the most challenging question in neuroscience, to me, I think, is one that has been around for thousands of years, and that's the mind body problem. The nervous system is a biological machine. It obeys the laws of physics and nature, but yet out of that comes this this thing that we call consciousness and maybe even free will um, and and uh, creativity and imagination and we have how 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 does that work? How do, how do you take a biological machine and out of it get uniquely human qualities and an experience of consciousness and free will. I don't know. People have been asking that for, for millennia. Yeah, the one thing I just want to say about technology, whatever is up, uh, happens is you should be on top of it. You should be leading it on top of it. You don't want to be your, when your kids say, oh, my, pa my parents can't program a phone. My mom can't, my mom's so stupid with technology. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 60, 62 years old and I'm, st I struggle with being relevant to my students. I just, I want to be ahead of them in every way and it's hard because there's so many changes and they're so on top of things and, but a lot of them aren't on top of things and I think that's going to affect their careers because they're not the type of person who, who explores that sort of thing. Brand new book uh, is out and I have MSU's copy from the library so you can't have it until I'm done. But it's called Only Humans Need Apply. And it happens to be about the, the future of technological change and the present of technological change. And the authors argue that you can either go down the, the path of automation or you can go down the path of what they call augmentation. And so that there are going to continue to be human roles, as, and you heard a number of them already up on this panel, that we're going to be the ones that design the new machines. We're going to be the ones that have to move beyond uh, very, very mechanistic problem solving to actually see patterns that the machines simply cannot see. And as one person said about Watson, the problem with Watson is that he can play a really mean game of chess or he can play a mean game of dominoes, but he can't do both at the same time like humans can. So the ability to actually shift and go is, is really uh, quite enormous in terms of uh, what it means to us as humans and frankly how limited certain technologies still are. Now, 
you know, watch this space, as you already heard up on this panel, in terms of what the future might look like. We have a question over here. Hi. Uh, first of all, this is fascinating. I'd like to take each of you individually out to a three-hour lunch so we could talk some more. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm an educator, and one of the reasons that I came was because I'm very concerned that we're focusing on skill sets that are going to be outdated. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit, I, particularly Angela, you, you touched on, and I think everybody here did, about how creativity and positive um, you know, thinking and things that computers don't usually do, that emotional side, is important. How, as an educator, do you feel we're missing that, that piece in each of your professions? Yeah, like what can we do in the classroom? In a, in a classroom to better prepare our kills, kids for the skill set that's, that's going to change in five years or three years or in six months? I think that's an interesting question. I didn't chime in for the net last question, um, but it kind of relates what some things I was thinking about, about where I'd like to see my uh, field going. You know, we we're talking about technology and entrepreneurship and things like that. And that's really like at the top end of society. We're not talking about the bottom end. Um, there are a lot of poor people out there. There are a lot of people who don't have internet in their house. There are a lot of people who have a criminal record and are barred from finding employment or they have some other type of barrier, whether it's homelessness or they have some type of disability. And I think what we really need to do as a society and the organizations within them is find a way to be more inclusive probably is going to have to start at the grassroots level and the community based level because once a person gets to college you know first of all you've you've narrowed um, and eliminated a lot of people because a lot of our segment of society is not going to even make it to college so I think it really is going to start by going into doing these interventions young, younger um, I'm currently working on a, a project for example um, is called EPASS and ASSET and what we're doing is trying to teach job skills to persons on the autism spectrum disorders in the local school district and persons at Michigan State University from 16 to 26. But I can see trying to take these type of interventions younger and trying to um, introduce people and in getting these types of skills. Like the notion of trying to treat grit, especially to inner city kids. That might be a good intervention. We don't know. But we need to experiment. I think by the time someone is like college age, it might be too late. I mean, we know that from a psychological basis, and I'm putting on my psychologist hat, is that um, your personality is really fixed by then. And so we need to go in earlier and try to help people so they can get these skill sets so that as they get into their teens and their 20s that they can be more successful. Yeah, go ahead, Carol. Oh, you, you want me to go? No, go you go first. Well, you know, everybody is wrestling with that question about how to, how to teach in such a way that you nurture a crop of creative minds and you don't make it this bunch of conformists, right? And there's, there, there's a lot of literature out there if you search for it. It's, it's uh, you know, how to teach more creatively in the classroom, that sort of thing. But one of the, a lot of the things we do really actually cripples the kids. They're, we're, in, we're, of course, you know, there's, there, you know, this, the teachers have to teach the test and all that. You know, there are limits for, for their, well, there are limits to what teachers can do, the freedom the teacher can have in a classroom. They have to follow a certain curriculum. It's very, it's, you know, there's certain assessment standards that they have to follow through. Um, I'm working with the assessment, uh, an assessment group here in Lansing uh, for art assessment. And, uh, but it, well, I'm also gonna be teaching faculty uh, next week on campus how to teach more creatively in your classrooms. I'm gonna be collaborating with three other people, two other people on campus, but, um, but there are things that peop teachers do that are, that are, that are, that are, they don't realize they're hurting the students, but they are. So if you have a, an art project or a graphic design project and you, you decide you're going to just show or show all of this other work that other people have done, look at this, this guy did this and so and so did this and so and so did that. That's called image flooding. And what happens is they're getting these messages is I have to do that to please the teacher to get an A. So it completely cripples whatever idea they might have had. Um, so, there, so, so teach them the skills to make what you need them to make. Have them explore, as you said, discovery, and then and then show them all that stuff. Well, here's what some other people did. Um, how you treat failure in your classroom is a whole other thing. So, for example, I uh, I teach that failure is a part of the process. It's not the end. It's it's about learning and growth. And you so in in one of my classes, I teach infographics. Um, is I have them. 
do several projects, animation projects, all kinds, interactive, as well as print media. And each one of those they turn in, and we critique them, and, uh, and we, we comment, and I write an appraisal of what could be better, and I allow them to go and make all of those changes, and I'll give them the better grade. And so, because they have something much better in the portfolio, um, I don't give any tests, or I don't require any quizzes, any tests. I don't think memorizing anything is, um, the Harvard Medical School has just changed from being uh, learn all the parts of the bodies and the bones and all of the, all the all, learn, memory, memorize, learn, learn, to teaching how to research what you need to learn. And because you, it's, it's, these are the skills that people need now. They don't need to memorize a date. It doesn't do any good. I want to riff on Carl there because the reality is, is that skill set's been offloaded to Google. We don't need it anymore. So there's a difference between memorization and learning now. I mean, and, and, and yet there's, you know, there needs to be a, a, a cultural change in terms of what we equate to what makes someone smart versus not smart. And right now it is memorize, repeat, get a good grade, grades equal learned, smart people who can go get jobs. And the reality is, is that it's, it's not true. And we all know people who had four points in high school that you wouldn't hire or give a dollar to to manage your money, right? So clearly, we, we, I think there's enough literature behind this now that we have to think differently. Uh, and there needs to be a movement within education to embrace that as well. And I don't know if it's, it's going to be a grassroots thing, as Angela said, I think, to really get the tide change on that front. Um, and, I, and I love Carl's methodology in regards to... You could to have just stopped and I love Carl. I love Carl. I love Carl and his, his thought process. But, but it's true. And I, and I, and I think, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to reimagine what, you know, how creativity plays a role in the classroom. Yeah. So. Okay. chemistry and biology and I, what I used to do is I would teach it like three lectures a week and you know go through the quantum mechanics what you know the stat mech and, and all this kind of stuff heavy math and I realized I had a student that was in this class and I went through this and I showed him how to use some of the programs and then I went to his PhD defense and realized that he was actually running the calculations everything was done incorrectly and so it was kind of a, a a pivotal moment in my thinking. So I then completely switched. I, I do an inverted classroom. So I actually teach them how to use the programs effectively. Uh, they work on actual projects that they might be interested in. So they then um, learn how to use it, uh, the tools appropriately. And then I teach sort of uh, the theoretical aspects as I go. And so that I, I think is really uh, worked extremely effectively. And I allow them to fail. You know, they run some, you know, I had one example where they couldn't figure out why they got these wacky results. And I was like, well, let's just look at it. And instead of uh, you know, looking at a reaction pathway one way, they had inverted it and were getting crazy. So you know, it was fine. They failed. They still got an A in the class. It wasn't a big deal. But they learned that, well, maybe I should like, think a little bit and you know, check things out more. So for at least in my field, I think I, I find the inversion works really well. The irony is, is that when I taught it straight, I usually got very high evaluations. When I did the inversion, I had many people that complained yeah. because they wanted just the standard lecture. So it's, it's kind of interesting dichotomy, uh, but I've, I've stuck with that strategy. You know, uh, just two quick things, and then we have other questions over here. One thing uh, I want to tie back to something Angela said that it's really important. One thing that we know about, uh, uh, for example, uh, diagnoses, medical diagnoses, is that Watson at IBM is actually uh, has a larger uh, compendium of all of the different uh, cases of, uh, you know, let's take diabetes, for example. So the computer will be able to tell you, given all of the, the inputs that, that the computer has, this is what's going on. Now, the interesting thing is that humans have hunches. That is, that they'll think that, well, maybe there's something that we're missing here, which it very well may be that if the inputs aren't you know, as robust as they need to be, you're not going to have a really, really good answer. But beyond that, humans are empathic, so that we actually very well may not want a diagnosis that's delivered by a computer. We want somebody who actually wants to sit with us and talk about what does this now mean to the rest of the days that you have? How, do you, how is this going to affect your family and so forth? So in that way, there's a whole number of things that people need to learn on the emotional intelligence scale and other things that are beyond simply the, the kinds of things that we've normally called uh, reading, uh, writing, and arithmetic. 
And in that way, I think that there's still a lot for us to try to, to get at, I think, both on this panel and, and beyond this panel. But we have a question right here. Well, I guess I, I'm, I'm confused because Cheryl Sisk is telling us that you know, our brains are not fully developed till we're 22, and yet if these kids want to graduate in four years, at 18, they have to decide what they're going to do, and their brains aren't even there yet. And if they want to graduate in four years, they cannot change their mind. And unless Michigan State has really changed, it seems like you know, you're all saying, yes, creativity and jobs are going to change, and every six months there's going to be something new. And yet, aren't the majors still really very narrow in your scope? And really, you should be educating people for a very wide variety of possibilities. But in fact, aren't they very small, very standard courses? This is what you have to take. So I, I feel bad for the kids. Arts education. Here, here. I, I got a, I, you know, went to a liberal arts school, and I had to take all these classes, you know, beyond um, just science. And being the total dork I was, I had finished all my science classes by the time I was a junior. So I was forced my senior year to take like Russian literature and, and things like that, which I actually turned out to just adore. I mean, I reread Tolstoy and all this all the time. And it was because of the liberal arts education, right? And that's not to criticize a, a more technical, but you can get a, a very strong liberal arts education at a major university like Michigan State. Uh, you just have to step out of maybe your comfort zone and, and take those classes that are you know, not in your sweet spot. Right. So. And, and the other side of the equation is that that comes at a cost if you want to extend your time here on campus, right? And it, there's a very real, you know, Real reality? No, that doesn't make any sense. But there's a reality to it, right? And so um, I think that's another thing. And, and and you know, so we're we're trying to think of ways in which you know we provide a flexible space in which students can explore, learn, and those types of things. But you're absolutely right. The 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 inherited system is rigid, and so it's it's on us as an institution. It's on on us as as faculty members to think about how do we how do we let students explore skill sets and not. I mean, I, I get emails after emails from my students who are stressed about making decisions between marketing or supply chain, and they're juniors, just because they're worried about their, you know, what internship they can get this summer and how it might affect their future career path. And yet, then they also tell me they want to start their own business. And so it, it's a really conflicting time period, which I think is reflective of what Cheryl covered in her, her, her pieces. That it's, it's hard to piece together. I, I didn't know what I was doing when I was here. You know, and so I, this is really rambling, just a rant. So anyway, go ahead. No, no I, yeah, John. But yeah. the other, the other thing that you're raising, and and I mean, you know, other people might want to go there, but there's there's a lot of uh, call for uh, two years of national service before people even would start college, for example, which might allow a maturation period. Or uh, m many parents now, I think, going against this. Uh, have to you know get my uh, child in, you know got to get a career. Are trying to really say you know uh, why don't you think about taking a year off before you actually turn around and and now decide. Yeah, okay. But but I think what you've also heard up here very strongly is it's important to be animated by values. It's important to bring values and principles, and that a lot of those things are going to see you through career changes and everything else. Many of us, I've hurried into graduate school right after undergraduate and promptly quit because it was the wrong decision for me to make. And, and so I was glad that I kind of walked away from that. But yeah, I think there's a lot of pressure. And, and bringing Angela's point up, and I don't think that we should ignore it, many people do not have the luxury to make choices. They feel that they have no choice because it's all about economics. So that if they are going through a college program that is going to be, for, in my case and other people maybe on this panel, a uh, first generation uh, college student where parents didn't understand what college was about because they had never gone. And if they're pressing their, their children, you need to, to be able to add to the, the family income or you need to be able to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps so you are not living in our basement for the next you know, four years or whatever the case may be. These are real questions, I think, that people have to confront. Not everybody feels that they have the luxury of big thoughts. 
And unfortunately, uh, we've probably thrown a lot of gasoline on that fire in terms of time to degree and some of the other things that we're stressing. Other? I, I have one thought, if I could. Um, you know, uh, <coughs> I just finished uh, Fried Zakaria's book, who's, he's actually a really good friend of mine, but he just wrote a book called In Defense of a Liberal Education, and I'm, so I'm a really big, I really agree with that, but there are other models too, so uh, the university a couple of years ago had a, had a they're, they're, the, Michigan State is really looking for, for the future, of, they actually had a huge workshop called The Future of Learning on Campus, like what, what how do, how do all of these people in this room, there were about 45 of us, how do, how do we see if you, the, MSU down the road, how do we teach? Are we gonna be teaching in majors? Are there even gonna be colleges? Are there gonna be more systems where things are mixing together and you're mixing biology with communication and music? I don't know, so we were exploring all different, and physically, how would it be? How would this, the university be laid out if it were completely really laid out? Which was really exciting, and, and this, was a, this was a provost initiative to, to explore this stuff, and, and it continues. Um, I'm the director of something called Sandbox at the College of Communication Arts and Sciences, and what that is, is the recognition that the, that we're a very siloed community. There's we have journalism and and advertising and and filmmaking and game design and these are all these these cliques, right? And every college has them. And so what Sandbox is 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 a it's the spirit of of collaborative, multi multidisciplinary, creative, experiential learning. So what what we we we've just created it's kind of kind of evolving as we just created. Uh, 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 the largest student group on campus. And what that is, is gonna be the, it's gonna be a mixture of every student group on campus so that all of the students can come in and meet and mingle and find ways to collaborate. We're already doing that in our college. We're expanding to the whole university so that every, so we're gonna have music kids mixing with biology kids, mixing with communications and video and all these different kinds of kids trying to figure out ways to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to solve problems, to tell stories, to work on projects together in multidisciplinary ways and experience what the other people do. Because you're right, it is tough. I, I have a Kleenex box next to my desk, uh, next to the chair, because there are a lot of tears. Oh my God, oh my God, my parents expect me to step into this dream job as soon as I graduate and start paying off my loans. And that's just not real, that's just not the reality. And so what the, what the university is really celebrating and trying to focus more on is the T-shaped student. Yeah which is, and I, having come from 28 in, years of an industry and I've, I've ha had a lot of interns, hired a lot of kids, uh, I am looking for one skill that I can, I'm looking for this one ability. And you know, they're young, but suck it up. You've gotta focus, you gotta do something so that when you get out of, you can't wait till you're 28 years old to start entering the job market. It's, you gotta suck it up and you gotta get out there and start exploring and learning. And, um, and, and, and it just, just to wrap this up, it's, um, the T-shaped student is, is, it's the T. At the top, you're very, very broad understanding, liberal arts, all these different things that you're good at. They're all hanging down like icicles at the depth of how good you are at them. But there's this T that is what you do, and you're good at that. This is what people can actually define you as being good at, and they can hire you at that. But all these other skills allow you to, to be a much broader thinker about these things and to really change and explore. And just to explain, why I know that is I was really condemned in high school. I blame the way I was taught. I think teaching was very ineffective back then. I, I, was, I was terrible at math and science and writing. I failed English. But I now write for the Huffington Post, a regular article. I took students to CERN to explain the science of the Large Hadron Collider. And I just finished a big National Science Foundation grant on evolutionary biology. So it does, and I'm, I'm a cartoonist is what I, my parents thought I was. And so you can, just because you're making a decision that's gonna take some time to figure out and do when you're, when you're 20, isn't, doesn't mean that's who you are. The whole, no matter who defines you that way, your parents, your community, it doesn't mean that's who you are and it doesn't mean that you're, you're only gonna be good at one thing or be able to bring one thing to the market. So anyway, that's I, all. I'm just gonna, uh, I just wanna to reiterate what Carl just said. It's amazing how quickly students, um, and I think any, all of us for that matter, how quickly we are to define ourselves based on something that really has, there, there's no reality to it. Uh, I have students in my classroom saying, I'm a finance major. You're a freshman, so what do you know about finance? Nothing, right? So, so don't define yourself as being, a, explore while you're here, learn about other things. You're gonna be in my class, just because your, your dad was in finance doesn't mean you have to go into finance, or just because your, your mom's a doctor doesn't mean you have to be a doctor. If, if, and saying at 18 years old, this is my, my chosen career path, and then trying to lend that skill set to group setting even with being dangerous at best in the, in the, is not a good way to interact with peers or have a good project experience while you're here on campus either. So I challenge all of us to probably, you know, 
every once in a while tell yourself that you're not exactly what you maybe say you are, you know? And that was so. a really good question. I loved it. Yeah, I just, I have a great story I love to tell, and I'm, I'm gonna tell it. So uh, I had a student get a PhD in, in my group, computational chemistry, he was gonna go off work in the pharmaceutical industry, but he was kind of a very flexible guy. He went off to Stanford as a postdoc and went to a job fair. And there was an insurance company that needed a computational person, right? So he applied. You know, he asked me, so I said, well, give it a try. I thought no way we'd ever hear from him again, the, the company, right? So I get this, you know, email, can I talk to you? So this gal calls me up and she's like, well, can you tell me about this, this student of yours? And I was like, um, he's a computational chemist. This is an insurance company. She's like, yeah, 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 you know, this is the job. And I was like, well, you realize he's a theoretical chemist. And she's like, well, he's, he has no bad habits, and I can tell him exactly how to do things, and he'll solve problems. He's been with them for 10 years and just loves his job, right? So it's never, the story's never told. I think that my comment of flexibility, this example, his name was Brian, uh, he was just flexible. You know, there was this opportunity, it struck his fancy, and he hasn't looked back. So, you know, I think that's an important lesson to learn. And now, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna ask the panel to make any last uh, remarks that they have. Then, uh, it's a great opportunity for all of you, uh, when we wrap this up, to rush the front and, f and uh, get their contact information. So, uh, let me just ask for any other things. Cheryl? Carol? I have one thing I just wanna say about, it, um, it's called limiting beliefs. It's a, it's a, it's a creative concept, it's what, uh, when you, when you're, it's it's our it's our it, it's our natural instinct to sort of just say that we're we're limited in in what we the way we think like we, like for example you'll say um, uh, you know it's not my fault uh, it's it, it's I'm not it's no use trying because it's not going to work out anyway <laughs> or we have there are many different examples of limiting beliefs but we have them all and we just say you know it's just you know I, I, it's just not worth trying because I'm I just, well, why should I go get my degree. I mean, there are no jobs out there anyway. Or, or it's not my fault, the economy stinks. And even when the economy's proved, uh, fixed, it's still not my fault. We have these beliefs, these limiting beliefs, and they cripple us, they keep us from, from, from uh, being able to actually uh, be the, uh, uh, achieve the potential that we're intended to, uh, to achieve. So look up, if you wanna know more, just look up these limiting beliefs, because we all have them, and it's, they, to, they stay with us till the day I die. And, um, you know, people talk about, what, I talk to my students about defining success and they say it's, uh, you know, I like to get that job with an ad agency and I say, well, how about this for, a, a, you know, def defining success on your deathbed? How about, I really wish, I really hope I like myself. That's, a su that's my idea of success, not getting that job at that ad agency. And that's what it's all about, having r a rich, lovely life. And uh, so that's what I, and trying to heal the student's psychology is uh, getting them to feel that, to recognize that they, that they, they should think they're pretty okay, uh, despite all the messages they're getting to the contrary. So, Lee? That was pretty eloquent. Uh, so really? Yeah, very eloquent for you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, did I record that? I guess my wish would be that the Brave New Workplace can be as inclusive as possible and include people who had not been considered before and then we can value people's skills and try to get in early so that we can, um, you know, encourage the new uh, generation to get the skills that they need to be successful and for employers to be uh, open-minded about um, looking at people even if they happen to be different. Yeah. I think that's a great comment. You know, uh, there's been a lot of studies that diversity leads to more creative workplaces. And so I think that's another, you know, strong reason uh, to not limit yourself. So uh, here, here. Let me just, uh, one building on one thing that uh, uh, Carl said, and uh, then I want to do some quick thank yous and also an announcement of our next uh, uh, Sharper Focus Wider Lens. Uh, the career advice that I've given to my children throughout their life is I've always told them that they do not, they should not reserve the right um, to stop any from, uh, anyone else from telling them no. That the minute they limit the ability of that person to tell them no, uh, it really limits them. Because the fact that the only way you stop someone else from telling you no is 
by telling yourself no to start with. And I think that they've been very good at that over the years, and I'm very, very happy with that. And the person who probably came up with that uh, stronger than anyone else, uh, even though he's a very mixed character in our history, is Henry Ford, who said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And so I would leave you with that and let us, first of all, thank our panel. Please join me in thanking them. I want to, to recognize and thank Stephanie Cpac, who really is uh, the, the strong backbone of this <laughs> effort. I want to thank all of you because of the fact that uh, it's always wonderful to see uh, some of our repeat guests who, who come back for each one of these and to see new people who we hope come back for the next one and the next one after that. Our next uh, Sharper Focus Wider Lens will be at the same time, 7 o'clock. And it will be the night before the election, OK? Hopefully, uh, you will have made up your mind by that time. And you'll be able to join us for something called Looking at Flint, the past, present, and future of the city. So we think that that will be a provocative panel. I hope you'll join us at that time. We'd like to thank, again, um, the Alumni Association for live streaming us. So I look forward to seeing you next time here at Sharper Focus Wider Lens. Thanks for coming.